Good morning, Redemption City Church. Good morning. It's good to see you all. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord with the family of the Lord this morning. We're going to go ahead and get started with the word of prayer, and then we'll continue in worship. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, just for this morning. What a beautiful morning it is um, to praise your name together with our brothers and sisters. God, we thank you for Jesus this morning. We rejoice in the truth that because of who Jesus was, um, who he is, and what he did for us on the cross, um, God, that we have eternal life, and we can spend eternity with you, and we enjoy your presence in our lives now, leading us and guiding us in your will and in your kingdom. Father, I pray of our service this morning that everything that we would sing, that we would say, that we would hear, um, that we would do this morning would glorify your name. And God, we pray for those that might be joining us or listening to this later. Um, God, that it would just be a blessing to them and it would encourage them to marvel all the more at how wonderful and, and just righteous and loving you are towards us. Father, all these things I pray in your name. Amen. So as we start to worship, feel free to uh, join us in standing. We're going to sing of God's unending love to us. So let's sing together, over the mountains and the sea. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing. But when your love came down, I could sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love for over the mountains, over the mountains and the sea. Your river runs in love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing. Of when your love came down, I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love. sing of his love forever. This next song that we'll sing out reminds us of our living hope in Jesus, that he is not a savior we believe in who is dead and who is still in the grave, but he has overcome the grave. Death has lost its grip on us in response, and we can praise him for that. We can praise him forever.
for worshiping with us. Brother Matt. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Redemption City Church. Glad that we're able to be here together. And thank you for those of you who are viewing online. And uh, I just want to begin with some announcements. So first, our next service is going to be 
I'll move this out of the way. First, our next service is going to be next Sunday on the 9th, so October 9th. And then we have our Bible studies that are going on right now. Those are on Wednesday at 630. And also, we have our Storm Debris Ministry that is picked back up, and we're doing those on select Saturdays. So I would like you to join me in prayer right now, if we could go before the Lord and pray together. Lord God, we come before you to declare and marvel at your total sovereignty and your providential care over all things. Lord, your word is clear on this matter. The Psalms say that you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and the plants to grow for us to cultivate so that we may bring forth food from the earth. And that fire and hail, snow and mist, and stormy wind fulfill your word. You make the clouds rise at the end of the earth and make lightning for the rain, and you bring forth the wind from your storehouses. Whatever you please, you do, Lord, in the heaven and on earth, in the seas and in the deeps. Lord, help us to stop and to consider your wonderful works and your mighty power and lead us into a fearful and reverent worship of you as the God who is clothed with awesome majesty and who is great in power. And even so, Lord, as we confess your greatness and we revere your power, at times we do face the hard question of your sovereign control over not just the good things but the bad things as well. The experience of bad things has led some people to doubt or even deny your goodness, but may that not be the case for any of us. In the wake of Hurricane Ian, dozens of people have lost their lives, billions of dollars of damage has been done, and numerous families have been left without a home to return to. We cannot presume to know all the exact reasons why you would cause or why you would allow a disaster of this magnitude to happen. But, as the preacher of preachers has said, when we cannot trace your hand, we can and we must trust your heart. Lord, help us to know your heart more and help us to trust your heart more. Whether there is a storm that is going on around us or a storm that is going on inside of us, may you still be our foundation, our solid rock, and our shelter amidst the storm. May we, as one of the great hymns say, judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust you for your grace. For behind a frowning providence, you hide a smiling face. Help us also to trust in your promise that for those who love you, all things are working together for good. Help us to remember that on this side of eternity, all of creation is under the curse of sin, and so we must await the coming glory. And we do, we eagerly long for that coming day, Lord, when we will be free from destruction, death, and decay. And above all, help us Lord God, to remember the cross where Jesus died. If we do weigh the suffering that we endure, if there is any question we have about your goodness, may we not tarry very long before gazing upon the eyes of Jesus, before gazing upon the cross and seeing the incomparable weight of the suffering that he endured so that we do not have to. Let us not reject or overlook the wonder and the treasure of your providence and your sovereignty. It is a gift for us to embrace, and with it comes the peace of knowing that we are always in your hand and that nothing can snatch us away. Our prayers to you, God, among other things, are an expression of our belief in your total control. We ask because we know that you can. And right now, we do ask that you would help the families who've been affected by the hurricane to recover quickly, and that in the process, they would encounter your grace. And we lean specifically very heavily into your sovereignty when we ask you this. Command the spiritually dead to arise. 
save souls, gather your sheep, make dry bones live, make stone hearts turn to flesh, use us, use your church, Redemption City Church, to proclaim the gospel and let us into the experience of joy of seeing you work your miracle of redemption. And we ask that you would not do this just once, but that you would do it over and over again. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Matt, for that reminder of the Lord's sovereignty, that he's in control. And I love that quote, that even if we can't trace his hand, that we can trust his heart. Um, this next hymn that we're going to sing reminds us um, that God is faithful, and we can proclaim his faithfulness no matter what is going on, um, no matter what the season is, as we'll sing, uh, that we can trust that God is faithful to us.
Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your faithfulness. We praise you just for who you are. God, even independent of us, you are wonderful. You are sovereign. You are good. You are just. Um, Father, we trust in all of those qualities of who you are this morning. We thank you for your faithfulness towards us in our lives. Father, I pray as Andrew comes and, and speaks and teaches from your word that your spirit would be speaking through him and into us. Um, God, as we open your word, we know that it is living and it is active and it is sharp. Um, God, so I pray that we would be convicted of truth and we would um, look more like your son. All these things I ask in your name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be uh, here to hear the Word of God preached and sung in prayers that exalt the name of Jesus. If you have a Bible with you or an app or tablet or some other device, you can turn in that Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 is what we're going to be studying from today. Now, around the world and throughout history, there are a lot of different people who have become financially rich. We would call them rich. There's a diversity to these people. Sometimes it's individuals who become rich. Sometimes it's families who become rich. Sometimes the means or the way in which they became rich is through good or righteous means. Sometimes it's through evil or unrighteous means. Some through hard work. Some through generous benefactors or donors. Some through inheritance. However a person has gotten rich, there's all kinds of ways in which that topic can be spoken of. And money matters so much to humanity that many of our stories that we love to tell involve money, whether that's imagining pirates seeking lost treasure and becoming rich, or well-known novels and books like Great Expectations, who where Pip has a benefactor making him rich. We all, to one degree or another, wonder what it would be like to have so much. We all, to one degree or another, wish we had more than we per personally have. We're studying 1 Corinthians still, and Paul has spent already a lot of time trying to help the Corinthians deal with an issue they're really deeply struggling with, namely that they are boasting over and above other, other individuals as to what apostolic teachers they followed. And Paul is telling them in so many different ways that what they have is better than they know and that they should be humbled by how little they did to get it. It's gonna become evident really quickly that in this passage, Paul is talking about them having wealth that is worth more than money, than earthly riches, something that money and gold and jewels, they can't buy, a knowledge and wisdom of God that leads to salvation for a believer from eternal condemnation for the sins that they've committed, and that they gain a deep and everlasting relationship with Jesus Christ forever as their king and their, even their friend. In this passage, God is going to teach us that as believers, we should rejoice more in the immeasurable riches we have in knowing Christ Jesus as our Lord when we consider how little we did to get it. How little we did to get it. And that we should rejoice as a family of believers, not just as individuals. As if we're competing against one another. Now I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 through 13, and then pray before we get started. Please read with me, starting in verse 6. Paul, the apostle, says, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all that you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings and would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. 
For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, you know me, and you know that I'm weak. The things that your heart wishes to accomplish in this moment through your word, I cannot bring about at all. I'm a bystander. We ask, we humbly ask that you would condescend and be with us in this moment and help us to treasure the gospel we have received in ways only you can do. Do your work because we're weak and we're needy and we're poor, but you were rich and you love us so. Help us to treasure Jesus our Lord and his gospel more as a result of your word today. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. The Apostle Paul, in continuing to work in these Corinthians' lives through this letter to help them turn away from selfishness, self-centeredness and boasting, he's continuing to work in helping them have gratitude together as a family. Paul's humbling them by reminding them that what they have was free to them, but costly to the apostles who taught them. So first today, let even we ourselves be humbled as we consider the magnitude of what we have and yet l how little it cost us to get it. Please read with me once more 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses just 6 through 8. 6 through 8. Paul says, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything in you, anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. Paul begins this section by telling the Corinthians that he is applying the things that he is saying to himself and Apollos for their benefit, ultimately so that the Corinthians will not be puffed up in favor of one against another. Remember that earlier in this letter, Paul made it clear what the problem was that the Corinthians suffered. He made it clear when he calls them out in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4, when he says, when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? They were boasting about who they followed, as though there was something to be gained, something different by following one apostle over another. They were seeking their own advantage, boasting about their advantage over one another. This is why Paul tells them plainly here in our passage, for who sees anything different in you? They all have the same gospel message, which was hidden by God until the time of Christ, and of which Paul and Apollos and Cephas, they were all stewards. And the Corinthians were not wrong to recognize the value of what they had received, but they were wrong to believe that they had more of it than others or special access to it because of whom they followed. You've probably heard and learned through life how, at least in some ways, contentment and discontentment works. We often get something and we feel pretty good about it until we see what someone else has, or we learn how what we have stacks up and compares against the other options that are out there. I am a uh, 
Some, some would call it a lurker, um, but I'm a member of a online forum for uh, forestry work and, and uh, equipment. And there was a person who asked a question on this forum, and I always will remember the first answer that was given. He asked a simple question about his chainsaw and considering some other options, the chainsaw he had just bought. And the first response that was given to this person uh, was strange, I'm sure, to the person who asked the question, because the person who responded first said, leave here and don't look back. Get away from this forum, don't ask any more questions, go home and enjoy yourself. And he meant that tongue in cheek. It sounded pretty harsh at the time, I'm sure, for at least a moment, but what he meant and he explained later is, you're asking a question to a group of people whose livelihood, whose hobby, whose interests are vested in the small minutia and details of every bit of all of this stuff. If you stay here, if you dip your toes in this pool, what you're going to find is that no chainsaw you bought is enough. You need more of them. You don't know what you're doing, and you need at least 10 years of experience cutting down trees before we think you're ready to start cutting down trees. And I admit, and I confess, I didn't get out of that website fast enough. My wife could tell you that I just know too many statistics now, I know so many performance characteristics, comparisons between different pieces of equipment, and it takes me effort to not believe that I need at least two or three more chainsaws or some other piece of equipment. But the problem that the Corinthians have is actually the opposite of this problem. The Corinthians can actually study the gospel more, and the more they do, the less they will find that they wish they had something else. The Corinthians can study the grace of God granted them in the work of Christ dying for their sins as the final payment for the penalty of the wrath of God that they deserved for their sins. They can study and understand more of the depth of the love of Jesus Christ for them and His persevering work in their lives as believers, interceding before them before the Father for their and on their, on their behalf. They can learn more about the Holy Spirit's work to guarantee that the faith they stand in now, they will still be standing in by His persevering work on the day of Christ Jesus when He returns to judge the world in accordance with sin and faith. Those who have stayed in sin and those who are now standing in faith in the righteousness of God that is gained only by faith that follows Jesus as Lord. In all their learning, in all their study, they will never come to a point when they find that something else could have performed better than what they've received. What they need is salvation from hell and they cannot get that from anyone or anywhere else. Jesus in his gospel is the only way. And we add to that reality, the reality that nothing else can beat this gospel, that they got it for free, that they got it entirely for free, meaning that the gospel they now stand in, the grace of God that envelops them, they did nothing to earn it at all. If you're in Christ Jesus today, this is true of you. This is true of you. You cannot boast of what you have simply been given of what you've simply received, especially if you did not receive it just as an individual, but as a family of brothers and sisters in the Lord, a family that God intends to grow in His own timing and in His own way so that the glory and the splendor of His grace may abound forever. Think about this. It's hard to see this at all in the English language, but actually this passage, the very passage we're looking at right now, even just verses 6 through 8, Paul humbles these people, and as he does, he speaks to them with the word you, meaning first, second person singular, second person singular. But then he builds them up using the word you, meaning second person plural. Think about what that means. What are the implications of that? He says to them in every comment to humble them, you. What do you have that you did not receive? And if then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not? 
And then he turns to them and says, already you have all that you want. Already you have become rich. Would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. We live, admittedly, in a really difficult time and place in human history with regards to how we think about ourselves as individuals or how we think of ourselves as a community. The North American culture is so individualistic. It's so me-centered, me, me, my, my, what I want. You do you as an individual, not as a community. Courtney and I have actually been invited over to dinner by one family that we love. We, ch we cherish this family, but they're so North American and that family, it has taken probably a year or more for that dinner invitation to finally fulfill itself. Just in the busyness of life and how we prioritize things and all of that. And we have neighbors down the street from us who are from Mexico. And the day we met them, within 20 seconds of talking with them, we were invited over to dinner and joined them immediately. I worry sometimes rightly that my own efforts at hospitality may be very small one day when it's compared by Jesus to the hospitality of other cultures. We're not rich in Jesus as individuals, but as a family. We're rich in his grace and rich because we have him who is worth more than anything else. I'll even say this, and you can take this for what it's worth. I prize my one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. I love to be alone with the Lord. I feel most intimate, most close with Jesus when I'm spending time with him just myself. But in eternity, I may not need to be alone with him to feel more close with him. I can't grasp fully now what it will one day be like to see a brother or sister in heaven and feel so glad that they would join the conversation I'm having with Jesus that I prefer their company over the joy I had with him alone. Because the nature of my heart and theirs, fully then in the image of the heart of Christ, is glad more so to be together as a family even than as individuals. We are rich in the grace of Jesus Christ and not just as individuals, but as a family. The second thing that we need to see in verses 9 through 13 that even we ourselves should be humbled by is as we consider the reality that the grace we have received for free did cost others greatly. I do not mean to say that they or anyone paid for the grace that they received, but rather this is what I mean. It is that the love of Jesus working in their hearts, led them to spend their lives ensuring that others would also share in the grace of Christ. Listen to what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 9 through 13. He says, For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Paul's not writing this list to complain. He's writing this list to humble the Corinthians by showing them that the love Paul has for them is a costly love, costly to Paul. Indeed, Paul himself says elsewhere in Philippians chapter 4, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned that in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of, placing, of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me, far from complaining. Paul is showing his love 
for the Corinthians through what he has suffered to make sure the gospel message would get to them. In fact, this love is actually the love of Jesus that Jesus is expressing through the battered, difficult lives of the apostles and what they suffered to get the gospel to them. We know that the apostles suffered. We know that they suffered greatly for their work in sharing the gospel with others. But how is it that Paul can say of the Corinthians here that they are wiser and stronger and more honorable than the apostles? What does that mean? We can ask this question, who is the audience that Paul mentions as making such an assessment? Who is the audience that would make such an assessment? Paul says this in verse 9, for I think that God has exhibited meaning put on display before others. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle, meaning like something that someone would pay to see. We've become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. Paul's not talking about God's loving view of them whereby in eternity they will be crowned with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, crowned with life eternal. He's talking about how the world and angels and men view them. To the world, the Corinthians look like God is favorable to them. They're not homeless, as far as we know. In fact, some of them own a good deal. They're not suffering want of food and clothing and all of these things, and yet the apostles are. From the world's vantage point, it would look like the Corinthians are being blessed by God and the apostles are suffering God's perhaps even wrath. For the Corinthians, when they are reviled, they probably revile back. When they're persecuted, they either stand up or flee from that persecution. When they're slandered, they defend themselves. Or even later in this letter, we'll see that they've been suing each other, taking each other to court. But when the apostles are reviled, they bless When they are persecuted, they endure it for the sake of others. When slandered, they go out of their way to help others know the truth about themselves and the message they proclaim. To the world, to angels, to men, the apostles probably look pitiful. To the Corinthians, for the Corinthians, the world, they look probably pretty good. We know that these apostles are loved. We know that far from being cursed by God, their ministry, even with its hardships, is a blessing because they get to share. They get to share in Christ's sufferings, share in his humiliation, and that they will also share in Christ's glorification, as we see in Romans chapter 8, which says this, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Paul and others did suffer greatly to get the gospel message to the Corinthians, to others. Who are some of the people that God has used in your own life or before your own life even who have suffered hardships to make sure that you would one day receive the gospel message. I'll give a couple of names that maybe some of us wouldn't be familiar with. I would not be able to read the Bible in my own language, in English, if it were not for someone named William Tyndale who first translated the New Testament into English and he was caught and strangled to death because of it and his body was burned. I may not have had the opportunity to hear and understand better the great news that I am justified before God by faith alone. I gained the righteousness of of God, as Galatians tells us, rightly so, by faith alone, as the reformers taught. They may not have been able to do that if it weren't for the work of reformers before them, like John Huss, who was captured and burned alive for his teaching. Or even simpler, I would not be the man that I am today if it weren't for other men in my life who made sacrifices of time and effort to pour into my own life. We won't know until eternity the full list of those to whom we are grateful for what they suffered to make sure we would have the gospel. It's so common today, even for believers, to look at the outward results of a person's ministry or even their outward gifts and their appearance 
And we make judgments about how successful we think they are. But if the apostles themselves were thought of as failures in the eyes of the world and men, shouldn't that be an encouragement to us who seek to just be faithful to Jesus, no matter what it looks like to the world? But we need, we need to remember something. We've got, as we talk to, about the suffering of the apostles, we talk about the suffering of these other people, we have to always remember that the suffering of others is always smaller than the suffering of Jesus Christ. Even the worst of what they suffered is still better than what they deserved. It's still better than what they deserved. But Jesus deserved no insults, deserved no hardships, no scorn, no humiliation, no suffering, no death, and yet he took all of that on for us. Jesus does deserve full respect, full recognition, full honor, full glory from everything for everything. And yet he gave that up for a season, the recognition of his honor and glory. He gave that up for a season in order to become like us, in order to represent us as he died for us. In Jesus, we are rich. We are rich in the mercy that we have received beyond our wildest dreams. Church, be humbled. This week even, take time, take time to really think about how little the grace of God that has been poured out on you through Christ has cost you. How little it cost you. Let those thoughts humble you this week and also consider that his love is not just for you as an individual, but you as a family. Think about what we've received. Think about this grace, the magnitude and the depth of it toward us. Jesus is never going to get back more than he has put in because he's our creator and everything that we would ever give him must have first come from him. Toward us, Jesus has always loved us more than we love him because our love for him grows forever and his love for us is perfect and can't be improved upon. Toward us, Jesus will always have to lovingly condescend to be intimate and close with us, but we'll never condescend to be with him because he is fully God the Son. Toward him, we all come from a place of having wronged him sinned against him and deeply needing his forgiveness every moment of our lives. Yet toward us, Jesus has never once done wrong. He's never once done wrong. How wonderful is the grace of Jesus Christ for sinners, for sinners like us. Now, if you're here today you, or listening to this online, you may be listening to this and you've not yet experienced the joy of knowing personally Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I urge you to do what Jesus himself commanded. Listen to Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. Jesus said these words. It says, Now after John, John the Baptist, was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. To be saved, you must repent and believe. Repent and believe. Repentance, according to the Bible, is not just simply stopping sin and not turning to something else. Repentance is stopping sin, turning from sin, in fact, to Christ, because now your heart prefers Christ over sin. It is turning from sin to Christ because your heart's been changed by the reality of his grace and his willingness to forgive all sin. And believing is trusting, trusting God that Jesus is the one and only sufficient sacrifice for your sins and that true and, and he is the true and final lamb of God who died in your place and who rose from the dead and who made the only way for us to be saved through him and by faith alone. And in grace upon grace, if you're here or listening online, and your heart is stirring to want to follow Jesus, he does not leave you on your own. He actually promises at least these two gifts. One is that the Spirit of God would come and dwell in you to help you have a change of heart so that your change as a person is worked from the inside out 
in the way only God can do. But he also gifts us the church so that from the outside, others will love us with the love of Christ, helping us to follow him day by day, walking in newness of life with our Lord and Savior. God is good. He is all the way good. Believe in his goodness and follow his son, Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we, we, we humble ourselves before you. Not a single one of us has performed well enough to enter into heaven. And yet what we have done is we have sinned. And so I pray, forgive us our sins by the promise you've given in your word that the blood of Jesus Christ is a sufficient sacrifice for our sins, that the perfect, spotless, righteous Lamb of God was crucified in our place. We believe and we trust your word. Bless us now as we turn our hearts from sin and to Jesus day to day. Help us become more like him. Change our hearts through your Holy Spirit. And thank you that what we have been given is so free to us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Andrew, for that wonderful reminder of the truth of the gospel and how even though Christ deserved none of uh, the suffering that he endured, he endured that for the glory of God, his Father, but also for us. Um, so this last song that we're going to sing, uh, on Wednesday nights in Bible studies, we've been looking at the issue of sin um, before a holy God and um, just the fact that we can rejoice that his mercy is greater than our sin. And so this last song reminds us of that, that though our sin is... Is, is a lot, is, is our sins are many. Um, his mercy is more, and he is ready and willing and able to forgive us. Sing together. Father, forgive us. Our sins are many We don't know what we do Ooh, You will forgive us Your rich mercy In your eyes of me Father, forgive us Father, forgive us our sins are many We don't know what we do Oh, you will forgive us Your rich mercy In your eyes are made new My sin bows before you Desperation, I say, what hope is there for me? So cleanse and wash me, Father, heal my heart, oh, I pray, with mercy pure and sweet. Father, forgive us, our sins are many. We don't know what we do. Oh, you will forgive us your rich and mercy in your eyes of me. Rescue me, I know you always will. My sin runs deep, your grace runs deep, but still you rescue me. I know you always will. My sin runs deep, your grace runs deep, but still you 
Praise God. Praise God for his rich mercy. Rich mercies we don't pay for at all. It's absolutely amazing. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, convict our hearts in the busyness of this life, in the desires of the flesh, in the advertisements, in the bombardment of media and everything that says you don't have enough, tell us we do. If we're in Christ, we do because we have you and you are worth more than anything else. Lead us in the life you want us to live and with the joy you want us to have as those who are the sons and daughters of God Almighty through the cross of Jesus Christ. And it's in the name of Jesus I pray.